Good evening, and welcome to The Right Side, the show where we talk about today's issues and important topics from an admittedly conservative perspective. My name is Chris Pareja. I'm your host, and this evening we're going to be talking about human trafficking in the Bay Area. I'm joined this evening by Pastor Tim Royal, as well as Alicia Garcia, and we're going to get right into things and learn a little bit about each of you and why this became an important topic to you. And I think that one of the things that we should establish up front is a lot of people have no idea how prevalent human trafficking is right here in the Bay Area. We always think it's happening somewhere else. But we'll start with you, Tim. How did you get involved and passionate? Well, I, I, got, I started getting a little bit interested in this um, several years ago. And uh, really, the, the person that, that began the passion was Alicia. Um, I worked with her um, several years ago at Patton University in Oakland. And at the time, she was, uh, she was doing some work with uh, uh, trying to, to create a, a, a ministry from there called The Safe Place and uh, doing a, what's called the Green Light Project. And, and she can tell you about those. Uh, but I began to be really excited about what she was doing. And she really educated me about the problem. I mean, it's 150 years since the Emancipation Proclamation. And, and there are more slaves in the world by far than they, there were at that time. And, and so, you know, this is, this is a problem that people don't even have a clue about. Right. And then sometimes in their own neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, honestly, the, in our part of the world, the most common uh, slave is a, when they, when they go in there, is, is a 14-year-old girl in, in sex slavery. My daughter's 13. I mean, this is something that, you know, my, my youngest daughter is 13. I have three daughters, and I, and I think about this issue, and it, yeah, I get pretty, pretty okay. passionate about it. Okay. Well, Alicia, talk to us. Hey, you, you've been evangelizing for a while. It sounds like you've already converted some people to your cause. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get yes. started? Um, actually, it started about seven years ago for me. Um, I was really concerned about young people. Uh, I work a lot with youth, and I was just really concerned about some of the choices that they were making. And I got involved in youth ministry at the local church. And through that, I started studying about it, and I was just appalled because you're right, people do think of it as something in another country. They think of it as somebody else's problem, and they don't realize that these things are happening right here in our back door. Right. And so I felt that people need to be educated about this locally because in order to do something about it, we have to be educated. Sure. And so and, that's how I got started. And so uh, when I first became aware of this scenario within the last six months or so, mm -hmm and hearing that it's happening on the peninsula, in mm -hmm. Oakland, in San Francisco, various parts of the East Bay. There, mm -hmm. are, there are people coming from Central America mm -hmm. or South America or Asia. Mm -hmm. it, is not, it, it is an epidemic problem. And it's yes. not, yes. Uh, and we think of the sex tourists and all of those folks going to Thailand or something mm -hmm. to go meet young boys or what have you, but, mm -hmm. but having it happen right here, what kind of statistics, what kind of, what kind of research did you come across that emboldened you to go this direction, Alicia? Okay, well, because of the nature of the topic, people don't stand in line and raise their hand and say, yes, I'm being sex trafficked. So they actually can only estimate, but they figure that approximately 30 million um, young people um, are being sex trafficked currently throughout the world, and that in the Bay Area alone, there's about 17,000 that they could conservatively say, but some people say that the figures are much higher. But these are just estimates, and they're figuring that about um, another million per year are added conservatively to the number. And that's globally? Yes, yeah. globally. Yeah. You know, the, the thing that, that just uh, has really blown my mind, I think, is, and, and what makes it so dangerous, is that they're estimating by 2014 human trafficking will surpass the illicit drug trade mm -hmm. as the number one illegal activity economically in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, a, it's a situation where there is so much money in it and there's less risk than with drugs uh, and lower overhead. And so the, the, the issue is not going to go away unless we begin to do something about it. Well, and what's interesting is 
uh, you talk about the correlation drugs and human trafficking mm -hmm. uh, and in many cases they are intertwined mm -hmm. like for example mm -hmm. the border security issues that we're having the southern border is known to be very porous and a lot of people think well it's just a lot of hard-working families coming up that are here to make a better life for for themselves and their family and, and for some people that may be the case mm -hmm. but what they're not realizing is the same drug cartels that are bringing drugs up and turning people into human drug mules are also major components of this drug traffic Absolutely. I mean the, of the human trafficking mm -hmm. as well and so but what's even scarier is as I've begun to research the topic we find that not all of the the people being trafficked are foreign born no we Correct. hear about yeah. runaways we hear about scenarios where there is a parent actually selling their children into the, the mm -hmm. trade or working as their pimp. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so I know we've had these types of conversations. Tell us a little bit about that perspective. We can start with you, Tim. Well, there was, uh, there was recently a, a, on NBC a story about a, a woman named uh, Min Dong. And Min uh, was trafficked by her parents. And uh, it began at, and this is not uncommon, child abuse in the home is often the beginning of this whether it opens them up to uh, the the idea of needing love and ending up in in the arms literally of a pimp who ultimately um, sells them into sex trafficking but in this particular case uh, the pimp was the parents mm -hmm. and the father began sexually molesting the girl at two or three years old uh, as far back as she could remember and then uh, from that age forward, um, you know, she, she says in the video, I literally thought of this as training. Hmm. And then at, uh, at 10 years old, he began to sell her uh, to others. And uh, when, um, when dad wouldn't give money to mom, mom sold her to get money. And so, you know, in, you know we think of this as prostitution. In fact, our our society has has labeled them child there's no such thing as a child prostitute whatever happened to statutory rape these are children being sexually molested right and and if you know we don't we don't think of them properly we think well it's consensual how, how, they're they're children mm -hmm. you know and this is a uh, this is a, a huge problem when when the average age to move into this situation is 14 then we know that, that 10, 11, and 12-year-olds are being brought into this, this sex trafficking. Because 14 is the average, yes. not, not the exactly. entry age. Exactly, right. exactly. And, um, you know, this, this, whole, this whole situation is just, it, it's massively out of control. And our laws are not set up to handle it. No, and actually there are people trying to legislate or push legislation that would weaken the underage sex kinds of interactions for their own deviant purposes obviously mm -hmm. uh, but there are laws that are being addressed to try to bring this up we talked previously about case law mm -hmm. did you want to go into a little bit of detail about that well case know. is the organization and and I'm, I'm it's escaping me right now but there's a referendum in the on the November ballot for for California and uh, it will give us the toughest uh, anti-human trafficking laws in the country. And Finally, I am, California doing oh, something man, for I the tell you, I am society. so excited about this. Mm -hmm. and, and it's been, you know, there's a, there's a group of abolitionists in the Bay Area and across, mm -hmm. uh, across the, uh, the state that are, that are really strong. And, you know, this is a bipartisan issue. This is not a... Uh, this is not a Republican Democrat issue. No. Um, Children are important to everyone. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And and so this is a. Uh, you know, I, I liked what you you said on your your website about the uh, when you were uh, in your on your congressional uh, candidacy website when you were talking about you know seventy percent of the things that that are really issues we agree on. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is when one of those. We talk as humans. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. We want safe neighborhoods, good education mm -hmm. for the kids. Exactly. Children who can't or people who can't care for themselves to be cared for and a lot of these things fit right into this category oh yeah mm -hmm. this is this is one of those that is just absolutely right down the line and, and back in 2000 uh, federal law passed um, it was at the instigation of, of George W. Bush who 
Uh, it was one of the first things he got accomplished, uh, and it was a, a human trafficking uh, law, and it was supposed to be renewed by Congress every two to three years. Well, you know, our Congress is so so divided that here's an area they agree on, and in 2011 they didn't renew it. And so now we actually have to, at the state level, uh, accomplish something that had already been done at the federal level. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the reason is, is in California currently under the law, um, a child who is, is caught in the act of, of pornography can actually be thrown in jail for solicitation when the reality is the criminal is the one who's pimping her. Right. You know, mm -hmm. or him. You know, and, and that's the, you know, it's kind of mind boggling. So. And Alicia, you have some perspective on this as well. And th that there are, we talked about people that are in some cases thankful that the children are being arrested. Yes, yes. There are some that. organizations that are pushing for children um, involved in prostitution to be arrested because their perspective is that it gets them off the streets, it gets them away from the pimps, so then therefore they can get the children the help that they need. But the caveat to that is that it gives them a criminal record and it puts them in the system, which can be just as destructive and damaging as it was in the first place. Right. And so, you know, it kind of puts you in a situation as to how exactly do we handle this? Do we want these children that are being abused to have a criminal record? Right. Probably not. <laughs> right. But do we want them away from their pips? Their pimps, of course we do. Right. But I, you know, we believe there's a better way. And so what is that way? I mean, what can we do as citizens, first of all, educating ourselves and educating one another that the problem exists, but how do we solve not the symptoms of it, but the root cause? How do we fix it? Well, one of the things that, that this law does is it enables us uh, to take the fines and so forth that are, that are levied against uh, those who are in violation of the law, put them into law enforcement so that they're properly trained to, to deal with this situation. Um, you know, as a, as a pastor, one of my perspectives is simply this. We really need to get back to traditional family and traditional marriage because a lot of these problems, a lot, not all, but a lot of these problems stem from broken homes. They stem from no fathers in the family mm -hmm. or they stem from families that are just so massively like the one I was describing, uh, Min Dong's family, that, that are just so massively dysfunctional and, and uh, ill. Yeah. Well, and parenting is a team sport. Yeah. And if half your team doesn't show up, it's hard to win. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so having the ability to have two incomes, if that's what's mm -hmm. required, or at least one strong income and somebody supervising the children, and, mm -hmm. and also communities that know one another and know what's mm -hmm. happening and know their neighbors. I mean, I've been guilty of living three or four years in a neighborhood before I find out who all is around me. Mm -hmm. And if you look at some of the 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 lists that are available, you find out there are predators right in your own neighborhood if you right. do a little bit of research. Yeah. And it's important to do that research. Well, I think that something else um, that happens is that there's a lot of pimps that purposely put themselves around uh, junior high schools and high schools, and they solicit children with low self-esteem, um, and they uh, start dating them and the person doesn't realize that their boyfriend is a pimp. They just think this is a person who might be lavishing them with something as simple as a McDonald's burger. Mm -hmm. And they start hiding these things from their parents. And before you know it, the um, pimp has enticed them to run away from home. And um, the reality is that the average runaway is solicited into, into prostitution within 48 hours. 48 hours! They're already solicited into prostitution. And so this young girl, thinks that she's got this older boyfriend who's, you know, going to take care of her. And, and he really what he is, me. is he's a pimp, mm -hmm. yeah. and he is pimping her out, <laughs> you know, as soon as he gets her out of her parents' home. Well, and 48 hours goes to show that there was some groundwork laid before they got to that point anyway, because people can't be, not all of them can be that charming, and not all of the children are that weak to be able to just move into that within two days of being gone. Well, yeah. believe it or not, even... Um, uh, Runaways in general are solicited into prostitution within 48 hours because they don't have any income. 
-hmm. They don't have any way to provide, and these pimps are there to help them out, you know, to get them strung out on drugs and send them out to the streets. And then they threaten to harm their families if they make a decision to go home. And so a lot of times the kids are literally enslaved and entrapped because they're too afraid to go back home because they're afraid of the damage it's going to do to their families. And so they just suffer years and years of abuse at the hand of that pimp. It's a very scary, scary scenario. You know, we, and we need, one of the things we need to remember is they are slaves. They're mm -hmm. not, you know, we, we think that because they're free on the street and the, and the pimp is not right there, that somehow they can leave that. Mm -hmm. But the reality is uh, they're, they're going to be found. Mm -hmm. You know, they, these guys are, are ruthless about going after them. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, one story I heard was from the Bay Area, happened on the way into the Caldecott Tunnel, uh, was of one girl with, with several, they, they work in harems, you know, the pimp has several girls that he's running at any given time. Mm -hmm. and, and this one girl wanted to get away, and he literally drug her on the freeway. Uh, just going right down 24. Mm -hmm. Well, setting an example for yeah. the others not yeah. to try exactly. to break And ultimately away, so. just dropped her. And uh, uh, the fireman, the founder, I guess just became a, an incredible advocate for, for mm -hmm. against human trafficking. And I've heard stories of emergency yeah. rooms where people have had parts of their body cut off with knives and, and everything else. And oh, it's... Yeah. It's brutal. Yeah. So are there resources that you know of, centers where people can, or are there ways to report these kinds of scenarios to law enforcement or others to do minimal damage to the person being enslaved or trafficked and getting them to a safe place? Well, interestingly, <laughs> there is a place called Safe Place. And um, what the objective is, is through what's called the Green Light Project, where people would put, take green light bulbs and use it during the month of November, which is National Runaway Prevention Month, and p use it as their porch light so that um, it helps to bring awareness to the situation um, so that people will say, what's up with the green light bulb? <laughs> you know, why did you have the green light bulb? It's also the opposite of a red light. And yes. so they were very intentional in making it a green light bulb. And um, what, um, what the objective is, is to open safe places throughout the Bay Area that are regular places like fire departments or police departments, even buses or different businesses where somebody in trouble, um, th there would be a sign displayed on their business and someone in trouble could go to that safe place and get help, where they would be transported to a safe place, whether it be home or to a foster home or you know somewhere where they're gonna get the help that they need. And are those signs out and around in the Bay Area currently, or is it something that's still in the works? Well, there are some in the San Jose area um, and also in the Vallejo area, but there are not a lot in the rest of the Bay Area. And so that is something that I really would like to see happen is um, more organizations, churches, fire departments, police departments, um, even McDonald's, you know, take an active role in helping people get off the streets that are really looking for help, where they can walk into a non-threatening environment and actually get the real help that they need, and, and they actually get them out of the area so that they're not in danger. And I'm assuming that you're working with churches to get this word out. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. yes, and businesses as well. And businesses. Yes. You Excellent. know, any pastors that are watching, I would really encourage them to have somebody from International Justice Mission or, uh, you know, Alicia would probably be willing to come, but to come and speak to your congregation about this issue because it's important. It's and, important. Absolutely. And I know of several groups who would be interested in the topic as well, so mm -hmm. we have about a minute and a half left. How mm -hmm. do we reach you to, uh, both of you and either of you, to have you speak to various groups that may be interested or just to learn more so that you can continue to educate us? Y you can contact me through my website, which is uh, housingbaptist.org. And spell that because... H A L C Y O N dot org. Halcyon Baptist dot org or Halcyon B A P T I S T. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, Halcyon Baptist dot org. Okay. And uh, you can you can click there for my email address, or um, or you can uh, you can go on Facebook, and you can like Halcyon Baptist, and you can just send me a message through the uh, through the church. Excellent, Felicia. Yes. Um, you can email me at agarcia at patten.edu, that's P-A-T-T-E-N 
Dot edu okay. and I would gladly come out and do a seminar or speak at a church or anything to help out. Somehow I guess involved. that might be the case. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you sharing your knowledge and educating us because this is a very important topic and one that people don't realize mm -hmm. is a topic here in the Bay Area and the story of Nindong for example wasn't New Jersey it was here yeah. mm -hmm. and we need to make sure that people are aware so thank Absolutely. you. And now We'll take a quick break and have a word from our uh, underwriter, the Conservative Forum. constitutional law attorney. And they say, oh really, what kind of constitutional law attorney? I say, well, I'm the kind of the true kind. The kind of believe that the Constitution is what the Constitution says and what it was intended to say. Anything beyond that is tyranny and should not be allowed. Um, so. so it's come to this, my friends. You're ready to second American Revolution against a ruling class that simply lectures but does not listen or defend the American people. It is government versus the people. Am I right? Yeah. Look at the Electoral College example. Right? A leftist popular challenge to states' rights. You think the founders were brilliant people? Did they not know what they were doing by carefully calibrating to get the small states and the big states to come together? Why does Wyoming get two senators in California? Actually, I'd rather have Wyoming's two senators. <laughs> And again, we'd like to thank the Conservative Forum for underwriting the show. Without them, this would not be possible. But besides just doing brilliant PSAs and advertising that they are out there, they do have a speaker series, and they meet on a monthly basis. Normally, it's the first Tuesday of each month. In July, it's the second Tuesday because of the 4th of July holiday. And for that meeting, they will have Tom Tancredo coming in, and hopefully he'll be here on the show before that. In August, Jack Kaschel. In September, John Fund, and in October, Jesse Lee Peterson. The Conservative Forum meets at the IFES Portuguese Hall at 432 Stirland Road in Mountain View. And in case I've missed anything or you want more information, you can find that at theconservativeforum.com. And in closing, I'd like to talk about something that's in the news uh, even today as we are taping the show, and that is contempt of uh, Congress charges being brought against our uh, Attorney General uh, and uh, the head of the Department of Justice, Eric Holder, or as some people would call him, Eric Withholder, for withholding the information that he has from Congress when they're investigating things such as the fast and furious gun running scandals. Uh, this is a gentleman who has been out to prevent law from being enforced as opposed to enforcing law. Our topic tonight of human trafficking is exacerbated, for example, by our open borders along the southern border specifically and along the northern and airport and seaports as well. But Mr. Holder has been part of filing suit against states who want to actually enforce 
their border security laws and could potentially help stop with the human trafficking and the drug trafficking that is occurring currently. Again, we talked about the fact that legislation is needed to stop some of these issues, and he actually will sue states who try to enforce voter registration laws or voter ID laws or purge dead people from the rolls, as is the case in Florida. What we need is a scenario where people who actually are in charge of law enforcement and being the largest or the, the head of the law enforcement uh, community for the country to actually work on enforcing the law. Now, I have to share a fantasy I have. I like to play dress up in my mind with Mr. Holder. I'm not going to lie. What I'd like to see him dressed in is maybe an orange jumpsuit, some silver bracelets, chains attached, maybe matching anklets. But if he's not going to enforce the law, we need to make sure we find someone who will. He has a responsibility to the country, and if he won't disclose information, I believe he should be held in contempt. On that happy note, I am Chris Pereja. This is the, conser this is, no, the conservative forum. It's our underwriter. This is the right side, and I hope you'll join us again sometime soon. Have a great night.